Hello, welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. A while back, I made a couple of videos about cables, specifically interconnects, and more specifically RCA interconnects. For those videos, I experimented with changing the cables between CD player and preamp. I compared just two different sets, the sort of freebie cables that were typically included with new components in the 80s and 90s, yes, that's the last time I bought a brand new hi-fi component, and a beefy, silver-plated, $20 pair of cables from Amazon. These cables, actually, which are branded Prefair. Before those, I'd bought two pairs of cables like these, also from Amazon, and these were the first interconnects for which I'd spent more than a dollar or two. I really didn't think cable quality mattered. I only bought these red and black cloth-covered ones because I wanted something more attractive than the old freebies I'd been using for decades. How did I reconcile my rather extreme cable denialism with my use of 12-gauge speaker wire on this system? I think I reasoned that speaker wire might need to carry some real current. I mean, say I'm maxing out this amp with 10 watts per channel. That's over one amp, and that's a lot compared to the milliamps that most interconnects carry. Like, say the preamp is giving the power amp 2 volts and the amp's input impedance is, say, 47k. And yes, I'm just pulling that number out of my ass, but it is a typical value of input impedance. The signal current would be tiny, much less than one milliamp. Why would I need anything more substantial than thick spaghetti? That said, I had a few cables that were more substantial, like these, which at least have gold-plated connectors, and the cables themselves have a bit of heft. If you watched my videos from spring 2024, you know that the silver cables were an improvement over the freebies. At that time, I talked a bit, wondering, really, about how much I should spend to upgrade my cables. But I was still skeptical about paying any more than I already had on the silvers. A while after I published those videos, my friend Chris offered to bring me some different cables to try. I took him up on the offer, and we spent an afternoon trying a variety of cables. For the purposes of testing, I used the red and blacks to interconnect CD player and preamp, and I changed the cables interconnecting preamp and power amp. Our testing included the two featured in the previous videos, that is, the freebies and the $20 silvers from Amazon, and the prices of the cables went up substantially from there, around $200 for Riga Couple 2s, $500 for Wireworld Eclipse 8s, $900 for Kimber Cable KS1016s, and $1,300 for Cardis Clear Reflections. I shot hours of video. I recorded each playthrough of our test track as well as our conversation. We repeated the testing for the Amazon and Riga cables. I plotted spectra of sound samples for each set of cables and both trials of the Riga couples. Subjectively, each pair of cables sounded different from the rest. My personal favorites were the Riga couples and Cardis Clear Reflections. The spectra are all slightly different, both from one another and between tests for the Riga couples. Reviewing the video, I noticed that I did bump and move the camera slightly after the first test of the Rigas. And while I can point out some differences among the spectra, I can't point to specific differences to say that those are responsible for the differences I perceive subjectively. Frustratingly, the differences between spectra for different cables seem similar to the differences between trials of the same cables. I also plotted the spectra for the same samples taken directly from a FLAC file. Those spectra are, of course, also different, and I can't point, say, to smaller differences between spectra for the file versus, say, the more expensive cables. Ultimately, then, I'm left with my subjective impressions of differences, and that, to some degree, those impressions are consistent with Chris's. I'm happy to show you the spectra, but the small differences don't indicate which cables are better, at least not as far as I can tell. I will summarize our impressions. 
we both noticed a significant improvement going from the Amazon Silvers to the Riga couples. In particular, the highs seemed more pronounced, and subtleties within the music became more noticeable. For example, I recognized the trumpet solo in Babylon Sister as a muted trumpet whereas I hadn't recognized it as a trumpet with the Amazon cables. After the Riga couples, the wire world and Kimber cables were both different, but I didn't necessarily hear them as improvements. Chris, however, thought the wire worlds finally made the song sound like he was used to it sounding. Specifically, the Wireworld cables didn't have as much in the highs, seemed to bring out the mid-range, and had an overall warmer sound. For Chris, the Kimbers were better, in that there was nothing annoying, fatiguing, or out of balance. They didn't sound special to me. Like the Wireworlds, the Kimbers had a detailed mid-range. Finally, the Cardis Clear Reflections produced another significant improvement to my ears, and Chris agreed. I did have some trouble identifying what exactly the Cardis cables improved. Everything was just clearer, and I felt more aware of what the singers and musicians were doing. The Cardis cables did not seem as warm as the Wire World and Kimber cables. After all those sweet cables, we tried out the freebies. With those, the music sounded compressed. The basic song was there, but the nuance was missing. I'm afraid there's no going back. After listening to cables with prices ranging from free to over a thousand dollars, what's my next step? Will I replace all of the interconnects in my system? <laughs> yeah, I already have for this one, except for the turntables captive cables, and I'll replace those at some point as well. Did I pay two hundred dollars or more per pair? No friggin' way. What about the world's best cables that only cost ten or fifteen dollars more than the Amazon Silvers? Well, I actually wanted better connectors than they're using on those. World's best cables typically use either Amphenol connectors or Nutrix budget line of Rheen connectors, and all of those go for two to five dollars each. I've watched a bunch of GR research videos in which Danny makes a big deal about the improvement that tube connectors have over binding posts. If I recall correctly, his point is that binding posts, made out of what? Steel? Brass? Probably not copper. That binding posts represent a weak link in the chain of copper wires outside and inside the speaker. I decided to make my own cables. I got three sets of four of these Viborg connectors, VR107R. They are rhodium-plated, pure copper. They list for $77 a set, but I got them on sale for $48. I also got 50 meters of Magami 2549 shielded twisted pair microphone cable for $120. It took me a while to make the first pair of interconnects, but the second pair went more quickly and the third more quickly still. With the deal I got on connectors, my cost for each pair of interconnects is a little over $50, although I had to invest in way more cable than I need right now. If I never use the rest of what I got, my cost is $266 for three pairs of interconnects. That's a substantial amount, but it's similar to the cost of one pair of Riga couples. Oh, and Chris has offered to sell me his Rigas for what he paid, maybe $50. I've got a bunch of cable left to make plenty more interconnects, and I probably won't go with such pricey connectors for all of them. If I go with Amphenol connectors, about $5 each on DigiKey, then a pair of cables with four connectors will cost me, say, $22. You know, World's Best Cables sells pairs of interconnects for $30 to $40. I'd say their prices are pretty good, so that would probably be my recommendation if you're looking to step up your interconnect game. Those will have gold-plated brass connectors rather than rhodium-plated copper. Now that I've got all this Magami cable, it would be interesting to test out different connectors. I'm absolutely loving my new interconnects. 
but I wonder how much of the improvement is due to the connectors versus the cable. If the connectors are, as Danny says, the weak link, then going with copper over brass may make a substantial difference. You know, it's funny, because as I'm speculating, I find that part of me is still skeptical that the connectors make much difference. And after all the testing I've done and hearing the differences among cables for myself, maybe I should be wondering whether the cables between the connectors make any difference. Hmm. If I could bring myself to use some Viborgs on some lamp cord, that might be the test to make. But how far down this rabbit hole do I want to go at this point? Chris made some great points that I was able to record. Rather than paraphrase, I'll let him do the talking. Here's the thing. Cables can make a difference, but the price points of the cables are crazy town. Even the stuff that looks like it probably was relatively hard to produce, and it may, may very well have been, there's still probably going to be 80 points in margin for the manufacturer. Let's say that they sell these for 900 bucks or something like that. It probably cost them maybe 50 to to $100 to produce, and that's including these, these imported German WBT connectors. Let's say, give them benefit of the doubt. Let's say they're using a 5x profit margin model, which is not uncommon in the audio industry. So let's say maybe they cost them 180 bucks to produce. They're buying these things in bulk, and they're 10 bucks a pair or 20 bucks a pair. Okay, so they sell them to the, the, the dealer. I'm trying to remember what our margins were back in the 90s, but let's say it was probably 40 points. So they're probably dealer cost is... 550, 600 bucks, and then they're retailing them for nine. So when you think about that, like, okay, 100, $150 to produce, $900 marginal at the opposite end. So then naturally, when you think about, like, okay, what does it cost Cardus to produce this? Well, the wire itself is drawn and produced in the United States. The company that they hire to do the production of the conductors is based out of California. Now, they've, they've got to manufacture this stuff in 1,000-foot spools or something like that yeah. because there's no benefit to them producing small quantities. And so then, okay, you bulk produce the spool, and where are you getting the copper? Well, this copper is coming out of a mine in Nevada. So end-to-end, mm -hmm. -end, everything here is manufactured in the United States. So mm -hmm. that automatically is going to add cost. The flip side is the quality control is a known variable. The part that, that when it comes to wire costs, and the reason I think that so many people say snake oil, and they have a valid criticism is that if a consumer is paying 500 bucks, a thousand bucks for a set of interconnects, is that commensurate with the value of what they're getting out of it? But that could be applied to anything in hi-fi. If you're talking about a $50,000 pair of loudspeakers, like the ones that you heard at my house, mm -hmm. okay, there's probably for the dealer 40% margin. Uh, on that. So they're probably, dealer cost is probably 30 grand on a set of speakers in that, in that price point. The manufacturers are probably making 100% margin on it. Probably cost them 10 to 15 to engineer, build, and ship. And bearing in mind that, you know, a speaker that's being shipped from France, in the case of my speakers, and being crated and shipped yeah, and they're 180 pounds a piece. Those are not cheap to, to ship right. into international markets. Now, what does it take for a manufacturer to stay profitable, keep their employees working, and so on? Whether we're talking about Kimber Cable, Cardis, Wireworld, or any number of other boutique hi-fi brands, part of what you're paying for is you're paying for the companies to even make the stuff and, and experiment with it and R&D it from the, in the first place. I would say you're you're also paying enough for that company to stick around for a while. Well, yes. I mean, you think about... So that you don't suddenly have an orphan piece of gear. Well, look at what Monster Cable basically is almost non-existent in the market anymore. And I think part of that is a, is a response to the fact that Monster really pushed themselves into the mainstream big box store hi-fi industry. The Best Buys, the Circuit Cities, the Magnolia Hi-Fi, once they were bought out. It was a profit margin increase add-on to the sale. So on a $100 Sony receiver, or $199, whatever they were charging for their base level stuff back in the 90s, there was no margin in that product at mm -hmm. all. Because the bottom line is that the stores would just use it as a loss leader to try to sell a system as a whole and maybe a TV set to a customer. Mm -hmm. So maybe they make 20 or 30 bucks and if they're paying their, their 
their guy any commission or their salesperson any commission, the store is not making any money on that. So if they can sell you a spool of 30 feet of monster cable 16 gauge or a, a set of RCA interconnects that have good connectors on them, Okay, now they maybe they've made fifty or eighty dollars on the sale by the time that they're done, and then they'll try to push an extended warranty onto you, and that is an added commission for commission salespeople as well. I'm sure it is in a car dealership or, any, or anywhere else. You know, so what are the companies that have stuck around in the industry? Well, companies like Cardis and Wireworld and Kimber Cable, and I suppose Nord Austin and some other well-known brands within the industry, they have been around for decades and producing products and you know if you pick up the phone and you call Cardis and you say what's the capacitance of my phono cable they'll take down your number call you back an hour, uh, an hour later and say we just measured one of that length of this particular wire and you're you're getting 50 puff per per foot or mm -hmm. whatever the value ends up being it's actually probably a lot less than that um, in the case of a phono cable are you going to get that from Amazon seller X out of Asia no, probably not, unless you can identify what the source wire is, i.e. world's best cable uses Mogami or uh, Canair or some other, and then you can go to the manufacturer's website and find the, the spec for the wire. And these things do matter in some cases. If you have a highly capacitive speaker cable, certain amplifiers will oscillate. If you run really long runs of too high capacitance wire, it, will, mm -hmm. it can cause stability problems with your amp. Yeah. Or with RCAs connecting a turntable to a phono stage, absolutely you need to be mindful of capacitance on the cable. The conventional wisdom goes, right, that, I mean, you know, you've got to have a certain resolving system to resolve the differences among some, something so esoteric as different caliber cables. I don't, right? after today, I don't know if I believe that. Yeah, I don't either. You know, you get into the into the value proposition that you brought up and kind of discussed ad nauseum in your in your prior video. <laughs> yeah. At what point does does a twelve hundred and fifty or twelve hundred dollar set of RCAs make sense in a in a system like this? Yeah. Well, the answer is that if you have two sets of them, you have one for the CD player to amp and one from the amp to the preamp. You can get a lot more bang for your buck with a $2,500 pair of speakers than you will with the $2,500 worth of RCA cables. There's no question. Yeah. Would I use the Rigas in your system over the what I think I heard from, and I think we should go back to... Yeah, your, I was thinking the same thing. Um, my initial instinct is to say yes. I probably would use something like the Rigas, especially if I could get them used. Yeah. And, and, you know, would it be worth 50 or $75 a pair for a set of those in the context of the system? I'd say, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else I can think of that's priced equivalent to that that I have any degree of experience with? Well, I would probably strongly consider trying the world's best cable, what are they, Mogami 2549s or something. I'd have to look them up to see which ones they were, but... Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that I, those are my budget XLRs in my system when I want, when I want to use them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was pretty, uh, pretty happy with them. They are, they do seem to be shielded properly. They are a twisted pair type design. Mm -hmm. um, the connector quality seems good and they're cheap. I mean, 30, 35 bucks a pair off of Amazon, very affordable. And would they compare? I don't know because I don't have a set of RCA. So it could, I, if <laughs> I did, I would have brought them. So what's my bottom line on cables? As Chris and I said in our conversation, you can hear the difference between cheap cables all the way up to the Cardis over $1,000 repair cables on my system, which doesn't mean you should spend, you know, say $2,500 for two pairs of cables or more for more sets of cables for a system like this, because you're gonna get a much bigger bang for your buck buying better components like especially speakers, but also phono cartridge, phono preamp, that kind of thing. So still, I think the price that you want to pay for cables does depend on the overall price of your system. You know, if Chris is using Cardis Clear Reflections that cost over $1,000 a pair, well, he's got a system that costs north of $100,000. So that's a relatively modest investment in getting 
everything that he can from those high-end components. Me, I'd probably be better off getting a better turntable, getting a better cartridge, than spending that kind of money on cables. And if you can make your own cables, which probably a lot of you watching can and probably do, then I think that's really the way to go because you can get cables that are as good as, say, $500,000, $800,000 cables. It's, you know, when you factor in the markup from cost that cable makers charge for retail, I think that DIY homebrew cable thing is really the way to go. At least it is for me. I feel like with my, say, you know, $50 a pair cables, that I've got something like $500 cables or better, you know, given how on sale I got those connectors. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. And if you did, give the video a like. Give the channel a subscription. It really does help out. And I do really like reading your comments. I suspect there will be all sorts for this video. And hey, I'm game. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you later.